All right, we're recording. Go ahead. Okay, so hi everyone. I am Rajat, uh, host of Unorthodox Libertarian Theology. And today I have one of the best libertarian philosophers with me, Stephen Kinsella. Would you like to introduce yourself? To hey, us? yeah, this is Stephen Kinsella. Um, and uh, yeah, I agreed to do the podcast because uh, seems like a good thing to do. Why not? Uh, I'm a libertarian uh, patent attorney here in Houston, Texas, a long time um, uh, writer and um, a, a student of the Austrian school. I'm an Austrian and Rothbardian anarchist, anarcho-capitalist, or libertarian. And I've written a lot on intellectual property, rights theory, law and economics, libertarian legal theory, things like that. So my first question to you, sir, is about like normative ethics. So how do you approach libertarianism from which kind of normative ethical theory or approach do you take? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think the classical way that people think about it is, are you a deontological or are you a utilitarian? I think that's kind of one way people boil it down. Um, which means, do you believe in um, kind of an a priori natural law type approach or natural law and, or more of a consequentialist uh, pragmatic approach? Um, I have never thought that there's a, a big distinction. I think that, like as Ayn Rand said, that uh, the purpose of morals is to guide our lives, to live our lives, which is a practical thing in the world. Um, so I always think that the moral is the practical, but ultimately I'm a principled libertarian, um, which means I believe that we have rights. So I'm a rights-based li libertarian. I think we have rights. I think we can demonstrate that with a variety of um, reasons and arguments. Um, but when we talk about libertarianism, we have to identify what it is we believe and then why we believe it and then how we justify it. And I think that what we believe is basically we believe in a set of interpersonal norms, which are laws, which are basically property rights um, designed to enable us to live among each other um, with a minimum of conflict. And we do that by assigning ownership rights to scarce resources, which are the types of things over which there can be conflict. Um, so that we know who the owner is so that we can avoid conflict if we want to, and then we can have trade and long-term production and peace and prosperity, things like that. But these rules also have to be assigned in a just or fair way um, so that people could accept them as fair because if they're just arbitrarily asserted or posited or taken by force, then it's no better than having no rules at all in the first place. So libertarianism is the is the belief system, um, the political philosophy, which believes that the only just laws or rules or property rights are those based upon the core sort of Lockean classical liberal ideas of property rights acquisition and assignment, which is basically original appropriation or homesteading, some people call it, and then contractual title transfer because – you know, if you own something because you appropriated it from the state of nature, then you can assign it to someone else. So those two principles, um, um, first, first use or original appropriation and contract are the core principles of libertarianism. Now, bound up with that is the idea of consent because that's what ownership means. Ownership means that the owner of a resource, once you've identified the owner, he has the right – to consent or to deny consent to other people to use the resource. That's what it means to own something. So that's sort of the core set of principles. And then if you understand economics and history and a little bit about human nature and politics, you'll understand that the state itself is inherently aggressive, that is inherently criminal, inherently unjust. Um, so you, this leads to anarchy. Um, the anarchist, uh, the anarchist type of libertarianism. Um, now, as for how you defend these principles, that's a whole different topic. But um, yeah, so the deontological approach would be: we can know these basic truths, their natural rights, which come from natural law. So that's part of deontology, like the rights-based view. 
and then the more pragmatic or empiricist or uh, uh, utilitarian or consequentialist point of view is, well, we just want to have rules that make everyone better off. Uh, uh, so now I happen to think that the the natural rules, the natural principles that libertarians adopt in order to reduce conflict to let us live together in peace and harmony and prosperity. Um, you could say that that is also – that has good consequences, and I think it obviously has. We can illustrate that by looking at history. The, the more closely uh, societies adhere to these principles, the more prosperous and peaceful and happy the people are. So I think they naturally go together. But uh, I would oppose you to strict utilitarianism for several reasons because it's, it's more of a consequence. Uh, of, of following principled rules that are just rather than the basis of them, <clears throat> and also um, there are flaws with utilitarianism. So I would uh, – if you look at the introduction to Randy Barnett's book, The Structure of Liberty, he tries to distinguish between consequentialism and utilitarianism, and I think he does a decent job there. Um, consequentialism just means that uh, there are good – there are certain consequences that follow from certain actions. Or certain sets of rules, and I think that good consequences follow from respecting other people's rights. So consequentialism, I think, is compatible with and complementary to um, um, a principled approach to libertarianism. Whether those principles come from a, a natural law approach, which is deontological, or whether they come from a, a sort of a, a similar approach like Hans Hermann Hoppe's argumentation ethics, which is more of a transcendental approach. Of trying to justify um, these principles with a somewhat of a, a somewhat different approach than has been taken by natural law uh, proponents, um, but the problem with utilitarianism as sort of a subset or a type of consequentialism is that, um, well, number one, if you can make one person better off by hurting another person, it's still wrong. Okay, so it's still just unjust. Uh, but number two, you can't know if the sum total of utility is better, is higher, or greater, or worse, or lower because you can't sum these things up. There, there are no cardinal numbers attachable to them because um, subjective uh, welfare is not interpersonally comparable. Value, according to the Austrians, is um, the way we describe uh, the fact that you can demonstrate your preference for something by your actions. So value can only be ordinal, ordinal. That is, you can rank them, but you can't you can't sum them up as some kind of quantity, and you certainly can't compare them interpersonally. So you can't say that if I rob Bill, you know, some billionaire, uh, if, if I take a billion dollars from a multi-billionaire, uh, it hurts him x, you know, x utils. But if I just redistribute it to you know 10,000 poor people, then the sum total of their utility gains is greater than that harm done to the billionaire. You can never do that because there's no numbers you can attach to these things. So there are many, and, and, and there's some obviously intuitively outrageous uh, uh, results you would get if you applied a ser if you seriously applied utilitarianism. Like you could say, let's suppose we develop technology. Um, that allows us to take one eye from a seeing person and give it to a blind person. So you could you could make a, a plausible argument that um, you know if if you take one eye from a seeing person, you hurt them, but they can still see. Okay, but if you give that eye to a totally blind person, their whole world is opened up, and now they can see. So you could say that the good done to the blind person is orders of magnitude greater than the harm done to the seeing person. So then you could justify you know, forcibly <laughs> capturing people, tying them down, and taking their eyeballs out of their heads, and I think most of us would reject that. But there's no grounds to reject it on utilitarian grounds because it would be an obvious utility gain, net utility gain. So it's just ethically wrong, and it's methodologically flawed according to Austrianism. So that's the problem with utilitarianism. Consequentialism is more like a pragmatic uh, view that um, rules that re that are principled and that respect justice and and they they reflect the nature of the world as being a world of scarce resources where there can be conflict and where we assign rules 
in in a in a uh, in an honest attempt to let people live among each other in peace and prosperity and trade and harmony and all that, um, that would tend to lead to good consequences because. You know, once you're secure in your possessions, you can produce more. You can have long-term projects, and you can trade with other people. And every trade that's a voluntary, consensual trade um, generates uh, ex ante gains because both sides are better off. That's why they engage in the trade. So once you have property rights respected, there's every reason to, to expect that this will lead to better results. So the consequences will be good. And there's nothing wrong with with recognizing that. If we if we lived in a kind of a chaotic, evil demonic world where somehow being principled meant we would all suffer and get worse and worse then i think that we just live in a world where the expression is you know peace is possible it's, peace is not possible in such a world uh, but i think we live in a natural uh, world i don't know if ayn Rand was right when she called it uh the uh, benevolent universe premise like we live in a benevolent universe i think it's kind of neutral but i think there's no reason to think that natural beings like us which evolved in the natural world and we're intelligent and rational and have goals and values that we can't find a system of rules among each other to live in peace and to benefit from living with each other rather than to always be um um um, harmed by just the mere fact of living among other people. Um, it has to be better. It has to be able to be better to live in society than to have to be a hermit and live on your own, which is not really possible anyway. Anyway, that's kind of an overview of how I approach these things. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that was a lot. So uh, I want to talk about some like exceptional cases with these normative ethical theories. Uh, or approaches, you know. So, for example, with a rights based approach, I mean, I also like, I, I consider myself a, a deontologist, you know, I also prefer the rights based approach. And like some of the exceptional cases when we are thinking about right law, like for example, trace, trespassing, uh, like <clears throat> suppose in, in, a, in a hypothetical thought experiment, right? Uh, you someone had to like get this one one speck of grass to the aliens or they, they are going to like destroy the world <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> and the owner of that land uh, who had a lawn uh, didn't know or did not give you permission to take that grass speck right so are you justified in taking the grass back to save the world? You know, so like, <clears throat> what would be like your response or how would you kind of resolve in your deontological approach? Well, I think, so one thing I would say is when people dream up these scenarios, what's the purpose of the thought experiment? Um, is, it, is it to really solve a real problem or is it to try to find holes in a theory? And I think I think what people are trying to do is sometimes they're trying to test it, test the borders, they're trying to try things out. But if we understand that um, law emerges as basically the elaboration of these basic principles I mentioned earlier, so so the basic principle would be you know the first person who uses an unowned resource is the owner, and then if he transfers it to someone, they're the owner. Those are the two core principles. The reason for those principles is that um, um, if if there's an unowned resource, no one else can complain if some first person starts using it because if they complained about it, they would be asserting an ownership claim, but they don't have an ownership of it so, because it's, it's the, the presumptively unowned. So there can be no objection to people using unowned things in the first place, and once you have the the right or, or the uh, unobjected to right to start using the thing for the first time, then you have it until you let go of it. Because if you don't, then we don't have property rights at all. We just – we're back to force. If you're searching for rules at all, property rules mean that the owner is the owner, which means he owns it compared to latecomers or someone who tries to take it from him. So that means – so once you establish – sort of like the regression theorem in money for Mises, you can do the same thing with property. It's like uh, – if, if you believe in property rights at all, you have to trace it back to the first time the resource was used when it was unowned. So original appropriation is 
sort of a um, a principle that it's hard for anyone to coherently object to. And then contract is a second thing. Once you own it, you can let go of it and abandon it, which means you no longer own it and it returns to the state of nature, or you could give it to someone else with consent. So just like I can permit someone to use my body or I can permit someone to use my car or my home, or I can deny them that right, um, I can permit them to have it not just temporarily like a loan um, or borrowing it or temporarily using it, but I can give it to them forever. That's what contract would be. I would completely transfer the title to someone. So those two principles are the core principles, but how they work out in society is always decided when two people have a real dispute over a resource. And remember, these two principles arise because we live in a world where disputes are possible. That is, conflict over resources is possible. But whenever there's a real dispute in the world, people in the real world have to have a real decision to decide who wins. And if, if, if they don't want to solve their dispute with force and just fighting each other, then they have to go to some kind of court or tribunal or neutral third party to help decide who owns it based upon previous uh, previous uh, development of the law. So over time, the law develops in this way. So the point is law doesn't develop by philosophers sitting around dreaming up ridiculous hypotheticals. It develops in response to real problems, and so over time you have more and more nuances and rules, which means that when you pose a hypothetical, quite often they're – I call it armchair theorizing. Um, so if you say, well, what about the blade of grass, for example, in the example you gave? Um, you're, you're sort of assuming or you're not detailing what are the background rights and understandings. You know, Maybe this guy lives in a society where he owns his lawn, but he's yeah. agreed to allow it to be used for emergency uses by contract or by custom. So I don't know. So, so it's, it's hard to fully specify the hypothetical to answer it. So that's one problem there. Um, the other thing is I also would do a comparative analysis. Lots of times people that are hostile to libertarianism, um, sometimes they're just confused or they don't understand it and they have real questions. But sometimes they just are arguing tendentiously, and they want to find a way to show that uh, following libertarian rules religiously would result in uh, bad outcomes in some in some cases. We call these lifeboats in emergency situations or lifeboat scenarios, right, or the one you gave. Um, yeah. But the thing to keep in mind is, um, number one, the purpose of rights is to deal with the normal case in life. And if we can't deal with the normal case in life, we can't hope to deal with the extraordinary cases. Yeah. Ayn Rand made a similar point. Uh, but number two, the question is, well, how would your, your alternative system handle this? So let's suppose we have a socialist world or a totalitarian world or a theocracy you know, or a fascist world. Um, you can always come up with a hypothetical where the outcome is horrible, like uh, two guys are on a boat, and it's sinking, and only one can stay in the boat, so one of them has to die. So libertarianism is not going to solve that problem. Okay, but democracy wouldn't solve it either, right? <laughs> so it's not a criticism of libertarianism that tragedy can happen and that sometimes bad things happen. Um, now, so in your situation, to get back down to it. What I think would happen is someone would pluck the blade of, blade of grass and give it to the aliens to keep the world from being um, destroyed. And if the owner sued, I can imagine a few responses. Number one, what's his claim of damages? Because if, if it hadn't happened, he'd be dead. So is he claiming you know, uh, that he shouldn't be alive, <laughs> missing one blade of grass? I mean I'd say it's better to be alive having – had one little thing stolen from you than to be dead. So his damages would be net negative or null, number one, in any real system. Number two, if he actually sued, he's going to be ostracized by everyone because he's an asshole. Um, and number three, what jury is going to convict the guy that stole? Or, or maybe the guy will, maybe the, the community will just, they'll all contribute to the, to the, uh, to the thief. To his defense fund, and they'll all pay the, you know, they'll all give the guy a thousand dollars each, and he'll he'll have ten million dollars, and he'll he'll be paid for his for his damages by the community, you know. Uh, 
most realistically, probably the guy would allow it. So I, I don't, uh, why would someone not allow it? You know? Um, so I guess that's my approach. So my approach is that if you can come up with scenarios that seem unjust, that could be the case where law breaks down and where peace is not possible. It could be the fact that libertarianism and a just set of rules can't stop all tragedies. Yeah. It could be the case that an alternative uh, legal and political system wouldn't do any better in most cases or even in this case. And uh, you know, so I don't think it it shows ultimately I, I, I ultimately when some people come up with these questions, I want to say, listen, our core principle is that we think aggression is unjustified. And aggression means the unconsented to use of someone else's property, their resource without their permission. So I think that in general, if you use someone's body without their permission, it's unjustified. It's a crime. And likewise, if you use their res their property without their permission, it's, it's a crime. <clears throat> That's my position. It's not a counter argument to say, well, there might be a case where the space aliens want to destroy the earth. You know, OK, until that happens, can we at least have property rights on the earth so we can live in peace and prosperity when we don't have the aliens menacing us? Um, a similar argument is made by by some Christians or some theists who say that, well, you claim you own yourself or you own your body, but really God owns the whole universe, so you don't really own anything. It's like this Native American thing where, oh, we don't really own the earth. We're just passing through, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah. OK, well, on the mortal sphere among other humans in society from among equals, you know, human beings, other human beings… Can we at least say that we have property rights in the in the land and trees and resources and our bodies, even if ultimately in some sense up in heaven, God really owns us and we're really slaves to God. We've got to talk about real worlds in the real world that apply among humans on the same mortal plane. Yeah, I mean, uh, so generally, I think uh, so the divine command theorists generally say that. Uh, since God is the one who made you and he has like he pretty much owns you. So any like breaking any of his laws is infinitely unjust. So we have a strong reason to, you know, uh, basically obey whatever commands or laws that God has stated. So, for example, this is this is one of the reasons they present to like ban the alcohol, you know, uh, like for example, in suppose uh, uh, traditional, traditionalist Islamic countries, right? Uh, they ban the alcohol and they also ban any kind of uh, freedom to, you know, like, like LGBT rights and any kind of like freedom to even make certain forms of like, TV shows or movies, they ban, they, I think, also ban drugs, they ban prostitution, and all that, like, when their basis is that, that God commanded this, and breaking any of God's command is a major, major sin, deserving of infinite punishment. So, the stakes are already extremely high for breaking any command. So, we are justified in 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 prohibiting these things, yeah. So these, this is what the general approach. Yeah, the, the, the way the way I look at that is, it depends upon what your goal and your values are. So, if you're interested in human justice on this earth, then the the reasons the considerations libertarians give, I think, are relevant. Um, if you're not interested in that and you have something else in mind. Like appeasing some higher entity up there, and you don't care about doing justice on the earth, or you don't care about respecting people's rights because it's outweighed by some higher goal. That is logically no different than the mentality of a criminal or 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 or, or a tyrant or a dictator. Basically, a criminal is someone, even if they're aware of arguments for, even if they sympathize with some arguments for rights and things like that they just don't care they would prefer to use force to override your rights and to violate your rights so i would say logically that's what these guys are doing they're willing to violate your rights for the sake of some other goal so in that respect as hans hermann hopper writes you have to just regard them as what what i would call a, a mere technical problem because other 
other animals or other things on the earth can be dealt with as natural phenomena or as other reasoning beings. And if they're reasoning beings and they have enough common values, you can appeal to their shared values and their reason. And you can say – you can appeal to that. You can, you can make arguments. You can say, I know you want to use my land or I know you want to use my body, but here's the reasons why you should respect my rights just as you claim – rights in your own property and your own body, and that works with most people because we have civilization and society because that does appeal to most people. But there are some people for whom reason, they're beyond reason. They don't care about reason. They don't care about fairness or justice. So in that regard, they're nothing more than an intelligent animal. So they're a technical problem, and they, they have to be dealt with as uh, uh, just by technical means like defending yourself, killing them, moving away from them. Trying to uh, trying to uh, prevent them from having power, um, so th there's no claim that merely identifying what's right and wrong from our principles will physically prevent other people from violating those rules. I mean, it is possible for rights to be violated, and that is one mistake a lot of people make. Um, and I think that's a mistake that these uh, these religious societies make. They they're not really dualistic in the sense of realizing there's a difference between teleology and causality or between description and prescription. Um, this is a flaw in the minds of a lot of libertarian activists, I think. We know they, you know, uh, some people don't participate in it because they, they see that running around telling people what's wrong isn't working. So they think that it's pointless. So they, they have this false idea that. It, if, if, it, if identifying a moral truth doesn't result in the right results, then it's not true. See, they're kind of a monist. They're kind of a they're logical positives almost. Um, and with these religious people, um, they're not recognizing the distinction between morality, a personal thing, and your ultimate you know, place in heaven or whatever, um, and the purpose of interpersonal – Human laws, um, which only has to do with when force is justified. So, you know, you can believe that prostitution or blasphemy or gambling or alcohol is immoral and you shouldn't do it. And, e and you can even believe that if you do do it, you're going to suffer um, in, in the afterlife or even in, even in this life. But it doesn't mean that using force against someone with law to stop it is justified. Yeah. So I think, like, first of all, they would say, like, well, they would question the basis of, you know, uh, this uh, libertarianism. Generally, I think the argument I see is uh, for, for, like, prohibition is that, uh, look, you do not want your kid to end up in eternal hell. Right, you do not, you do not want the, your kid to suffer extremely forever. You do not want the society to be corrupted by, you know, prostitution or alcohol or you know, gambling, or some of these, some of these activities. And a corrupt society, uh, a corrupt society, like will be punished by God. Like breaking God's command is unjust itself directly so they, they well, are... well it's, it's not unjust in the same meaning because unjust means basically it means you're violating someone's rights so you can't say it's violating god's rights because god is too different and powerful from us to we don't have the capacity to hurt him really yeah so you, you you can't say it violates god's rights to do something he doesn't want you to do um so I can't – I don't know how you can say it's unjust uh, in the same sense that we mean. Uh, you could say that it's a sin, but all that means is that you're doing something that is immoral according to God's divine wisdom, and maybe that he will – that will result in certain consequences to you. Like you're going to be denied the blessings of God's presence in the afterlife uh, or even now, right? Um, so there could be consequences for acting a certain way, but I don't. I, I don't know if the word "just" is one I would use there. Hmm. So I think they would probably say like it's it's uh, it's uh, like when you say like uh, 
unjust like when we, when they use the word unjust they would say like breaking any god any command of god is unjust so they are pretty much using a kind of perhaps different definition of unjust. i think it is different i think they mean you shouldn't do it yeah <clears throat> you shouldn't do it yeah that, that's one thing like you have uh, this like strong moral reason because god commanded that that's or maybe right. they, or maybe they mean God's justice sort of informs, has to inform all of what our 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 mortal and human laws and justice are about. Yeah. Um, but the the other problem with that reasoning is it's sort of simplistic. It assumes that, um, it assumes that law is the is the best or even a good way to achieve something, and it's not always. So, for example, let's suppose our goal was to have a society where alcohol use was minimized. Um, it's not clear that just passing a law prohibiting it is going to do it, and it, it might cause more problems than – like like, so, like any religion that prohibits alcohol is also going to permit crime and murder, right? So – but we know from the experiment in the US when we had alcohol prohibition, when you prohibit it, number one, people keep drinking, so you haven't stopped it. You might have reduced it somewhat, yeah. but number two, you also cause the re you cause the uh, the uh, the criminal gangs to emerge, and which causes uh, all kinds of other problems, which also are prohibited by by God's law. Um, so it's not clear that the solution, when you identify something that is a divine act, uh, uh, unjust act, or, or a set or, or a set of practices. It's not clear that that should be made part of the of the of the, of the law, mm -hmm. right? With, I mean, I mean, if 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 you have slightly reduced alcohol use but many more murders because you have prohibition, is it clear that that's what God's law would want? Yeah, and I mean, I think so. The thing with like prohibition, as you said, like it, it, it makes the activities go underground and more dangerous to be dealt with. And basically more people would die from these activities. Now, they would say that I think uh, that they want to minimize people going to hell and maximize people going to heaven. Yeah, what I'm heaven. what I'm saying is there's there's no clear reason to think that such a law would do that because – you might create a whole class of people that are murderers, so they're going to hell now because they're murderers and criminals, right? The bootleggers and 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 um, the, all the all the gangs. Um, so you've created you you've increased the number of people going to hell in one respect, and you might have only slightly reduced it in the other. So I, I mean, I guess you could do some kind of moral utilitarianism and try to sum up, you know, may, maybe there was a million souls going to hell a year. Before and maybe now there's 1.1 million going to hell, like 900,000 going from alcohol and 200,000 going because they're part of the criminal gangs now. I, how can you know this kind of stuff? So the only way to know it is to live by principles, to have those principles and to try to respect rights. And we know that if you have a set of principles that are oriented around the goal of having people live in peace and prosperity… That's going – there's every reason to think that's going to be conducive towards increasing the amount of peace in society, and the more peace there is, the better people are, and the less of them will go to hell and commit sin. So I, you, you can make all these arguments, but it's, there's no reason to think a bunch of priests are going to be experts in this legal science. It's not, it's not a question of morality or religion. It's a question of legal science then, and once you get into legal science, we're talking about… Mortal justice, right? And we're talking again about what's just and what can be justified. And you simply can't justify violently harming someone because of some higher goal. Because yeah. again, logically speaking, every criminal has a higher goal. He's willing to violate your rights and to and to break the breach of peace because he has a, he, he has a, a higher value. He values his own gains. But that's the same as these people that pass these laws for religious reasons to make people better off. They want to help people, but still they have a value that's other than peace and prosperity and freedom 
they're willing to run, ride roughshod over individual rights in the name of some higher value or goal. Yeah. Just like a dictator, just like a just like a, a totalitarian state, just like the Nazis, you know, just like a criminal, just like a thief. Yeah, I mean, so how do you like perhaps kind of maybe like persuade the the traditionalists to kind of you know see what our our side or you know uh, appreciate our side? Now that sense. now that's a, that's a whole different issue. Uh, how do we yeah. persuade people? Um, um, I mean, one approach would be you know just point to the the natural law tradition of John Locke. I mean, John Locke had a whole argument about how he tried to combine sort of a, 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 the, a theism with natural rights. He said, look, God God is up there, and God is all good, and God is all knowing and all that, but he, he gave us the earth to use. Mm -hmm. So what you try to do is you try to anchor the core libertarian principles of, of, of initial or original appropriation in like God set us up that way. He gave us ownership of our own bodies, and he gave us ownership of the animals and the and the fields and the unowned things. So you could say that so – let, let's suppose you go to a, a concert or a movie or an Apple store, and you have to wait in line and queue for something. Um, everyone respects the rules of that venue when they're forming up to buy their tickets. They get in line. Now, it's not really an actual property right because you're standing on property owned by the the venue or something like that. But the owner of the venue sets up or allows to be set up within that kind of a microcosm of property-like rules, like everyone stands in line. Like that's sort of like a property right you're placed in line. Um, Likewise, I think you could imagine that the entire earth, even if God owns it and God owns us and we're all slaves to God and all this, still within the rules of, the, of this big game God set up, within that rule, God set up basically libertarian rules because God does believe in peace. He does believe he, he opposes violence, yeah. and he opposes sin and all these things, but I, I don't see any reason you could argue any good, just God that most – sensible religions believe in um, is opposed to the idea of people living in harmony and peace and prosperity. That's the whole point of all the great religions, right? Yeah. So I guess that's one That's one response. Um, the other is, I mean, I know like uh, some of my friends have written books uh, trying to explain why – like to Christians, for example, why libertarianism is the one political philosophy that is most compatible with the ethics – um, of the Bible, of the Christian Bible, and I, I assume people have made similar attempts for Judaism and Islam and, and other yeah. religions. Yeah, yeah, there is like uh, Mustafa Akil who has written a libertarian book, you know, to support uh, yeah. a kind of libertarian view of the world. Yeah, and like now, now personally, I also believe in God. Now, I think. God is loving, kind, you know, compassionate and just, right? Now, I do not think he's going to like punish people for like consensual, like like punish people forever <laughs> in eternal hell with great with great suffering and misery forever for like uh, like consensual actions, right? Which which do not harm anyone. And if, if, if there is any harm, that harm is like very minute, like perhaps two people are boxing, right? The harm is not perhaps that much great. So it, so generally I say is, look, it, it does not seem like God is going to be, if, if God is like loving, just, compassionate, merciful, and ha cares about people, then he is not going to be so angry at like people doing like drinking alcohol or something like people god would be angry if 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 you if someone drinks alcohol then harms someone well but but you the question really would be and i i'm not a I, i'm i'm an atheist okay but but i'm willing to go with this metaphor or whatever this paradigm but um the question is would god be angry at a society that did not have a law against alcohol use or would he be angry 
at a society that did have alcohol prohibition. He might be angry at that because he might think it's unjust to use force against people who are innocent. He might prefer them to – I mean he did give us free will, which means he gave us the ability to sin. Right. Yeah. He didn't remove our ability to sin, so we have the free choice, the ability to sin. And when you impose a, a law to stop you from doing something just because it's bad for you to do it, then you're trying to like almost prevent people from having the choice. If we lived in a society with 100 percent uh, effective laws where the, the state had these micro robots and they could just instantly prevent you from violating any law they passed, then – they're almost removing your ability to be moral. Like, so let's say they, they made a, like everything we we list is immoral, that, that or everything we list is being moral. Like the the, uh, the the Bible commands this set of principles. You know, you have to be honest, you have to be faithful, you have to you know all these things, right? You, you have to be chaste. You can't you can't lie. <laughs> you have to be hardworking. Yeah. If yeah. if you could pass a law for every one of those things and it could be enforced. You'd be just a robot. You wouldn't even have the ability to do evil, which means you wouldn't have the ability to do good. Yeah. So I would argue that laws that prevent you from doing things that are immoral and only immoral take away your agency and prevent you from being moral. To be moral, mm -hmm. you need to have the ability to choose immorality and then to choose not to. So um, that, that would be one response, right? Um, and, but then the other would be – imagine this. So we, we pass a law tomorrow that says alcohol is illegal, but the yeah. font the, – the penalty is um, – we're, we're not going to have a, a big police force policing it, so it's really easy to not get caught. And um, the penalty, if you get caught, is like a $20 fine. Okay, So it's illegal, but the penalty is very low. Well, it's not going to dissuade very much alcohol use, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you could also have the most uh, draconian sanctions. You could have – you could hire half the population as policemen running around looking for alcohol use, and you'd have to tax everyone into oblivion to do that and have tons of jails. And or you could even make it capital punishment. You could say if you're caught with, with even a tiny bit of alcohol, you're going to be executed right away. Okay, you could have that, and that would – probably wipe out alcohol. It'd probably wipe out society too, but you could do that. The point is you have a wide range of options and what the law would be. It's not just binary law or no law. It's a legal response to the issue, and there's no way that, that theology or religion can tell you which you should have. Should, should you have a minor penalty, a medium penalty, or a strong penalty? Yeah, there's, no, there's no principled answer to that, so the if there's no principled answer to that, that means that God would probably be okay with any of them, so he'd be okay with a light punishment. But if he's okay with a light punishment, why wouldn't he be okay with it not being illegal at all and just having it up to social ostracism and moral conventions and moral advice? Hmm. You know, th there's it, it, What I'm saying is it just doesn't follow from the idea… That something is immoral according to God's eternal commands, mm -hmm. that there should be a law. Yeah, it so, just doesn't follow. It doesn't mean God wants there to be a law. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. I think they also have like a, a book of law, right? They like so not Christians, perhaps like the traditionalist, uh, uh, traditionalist uh, Muslims do have a book of law. You know, it's Sharia, right? Yeah. So according to their book, they, they, they must follow those, those laws that are like followed by, you know, uh, Muhammad and other people who, who, who made those like laws, like they are God's laws. So if like God already made those laws, so you have to follow them or will you will be punished in the afterlife or something like that. So according to them they already have the law it's not just immoral it's it must be legal based on the god's command you know the hadiths you know the, well, the fix their justice justice system you know 
I mean, already having the law is not – I mean that doesn't mean it's justified. So the question is if you come up with a set of laws that violate individual human rights, is it justified or not? And the answer is not – well, as long as it's been around for a long time, it's justified. Um, so I would say it's still unjust. Um, you know, you can come up with all kinds of crazy scenarios if you if you take theism seriously. Like you could say, um, you know, a certain percentage of, of of babies that are born will grow up and choose sin, and they will go to hell. I don't know. Let's say ten percent, twenty percent, whatever it is. But when they're a baby, <laughs> they haven't had time to sin yet. So presumably. A, all babies are going to heaven if they die. So, you know, if you decided to run around murdering babies, you'd go to hell yourself because you're committing murder, but you could be saving thousands of souls. So, in a way, you're doing a, a good thing. So, you should be rewarded. You should go to heaven. I mean, the whole thing is absurd. It's like dividing by zero. If you want to divide by zero, you can get any result. Once you assume these irrational principles, and they're irrational in the sense because they're they're assumed to be absolute and just arbitrarily decreed somehow. I mean, how we get them is one thing, but you say, okay, it's in the Hadith, it's in it's in the Sharia. Uh, okay, or some guy said it. Some guy some guy said he's a prophet. He got it, but it's still just a decree. It's an announcement of divine knowledge. And once you have this absolute knowledge, then rational discourse is impossible. Because if you say, well. This law is justified because God told me it was. How can I argue against that? I, I, I could say, well, according to Lockean theory and libertarianism, it's blah, blah, blah. They'll say it doesn't matter. God told me. There's, there's no arguing. You have to question their, like, pretty much God, right? Their epistemology. Like, how, how do they know that, that God actually commanded them? How do they know that it is what? What has to be done, or something? Well, and, like and then we, you know, we have a, a big debate among secularists and libertarians and thinkers about whether theology and, and theism is even compatible with with libertarianism and with reason. Um, now, most traditionalists think that they complement each other, and one flows from the other, or really, they think that they think that reason, human reason, flows from you know God's divine grace and the the, the scriptures, the Bible, um, all this stuff. But you know the Ayn Rand people, the atheists, um, the secularists, they they think that basically there's a, there's a tension between one side and the other. One's irrationalism and one's rationalism, or one one's reason and one's irrationalism. And humans are actually pretty good at compartmentalizing and going to church on Sundays and believing. Ridiculous stuff, but the rest of the time they don't really believe it. You know, um, <clears throat> I mean, why do people cry at funerals if they really believe in the afterlife? Why are they even sad? You know, yeah. their their mother, their mother, their mother's with God now. They should be happy, but they instead they cry. They don't really quite yeah. believe what they say. I think. I, I would say like so to be charitable to them, uh, you know. Uh, so. But you talked about like you know <laughs> killing those babies if they are going to go to heaven. I mean, they could like one escape route for them would be that uh, if you do that, then God can still like the soul, the control of the soul of that baby is still by God, so He can send that soul to somewhere else so that the soul can practice its free will. You know, <laughs> so. You wouldn't just be damning yourself. That's called fighting the hypo. Yeah, that's fighting the hypo. I mean, I don't, I don't know of any theology that has a uh, gives people such power that they can they can make God put these poor early murdered babies into a special room to live an alternative life in an HBO sitcom or something, you know. But okay, sure, you could say that you could you could you could deny the you could deny the hypo, but. Uh, but you know, I think lots of terrorists they say things like that, like, oh, they know they kill innocent civilians, but the ones that are holy and good will God will take care of them anyway. I mean, people do all kinds of outrageous things in the name of uh, allegedly spiritual principles. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, this is why, like, I think theology 
like just based on like reasoning i think it is compatible with libertarianism i mean i believe in god and i am i'm like mostly dealing with philosophy of religion you know mostly reading the works here and i do read like libertarian works you know like robert nozick mark d mark d friedman you know danny frederick and uh, david friedman and your work i i really really appreciated your work for with intellectual property so like uh generally like if you have encountered some of the like have you have you ever encountered the traditionalists who are arguing in favor of these prohibitionist laws what have you like have you ever like talked to them like how what well most people i know that favor are they just they're just not libertarians they 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 don't distinguish morality from 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 justice basically so most people are so – and partly it's because of the world we were born into. We're born into a world with an advanced state and a large democracy and a world with an outpouring of legislation and laws where every little thing someone wants, they lobby the government to get a law passed in their favor. So we're used to a world now where uh, – I mean I had this conversation with my grandmother before she died a long time ago. Simple country lady, nice lady, but… I asked her. I said, um, "I said, do you think that uh, drugs should be illegal?" She said, "Yes." I said, "Why?" She says, "People shouldn't do drugs." But you see, those aren't the same thing. I, I might even agree people shouldn't do drugs, yeah. but it's not the same question as it should be illegal. So when you collapse morality or law into morality, and you think that everything that's immoral should be made illegal. The converse also happens, which is dangerous, which is legal positivism, which is the idea that law comes from someone decreeing what the law is rather than us discovering what the law is by the application of reason and integration with ethical principles and history and experience and that kind of thing. So in other words, if you start thinking – if you start equating law and morality, which is implied by this idea that everything that's immoral we should make illegal, or at least the serious things, right? Alcohol, prostitution, pornography, blasphemy, uh, that kind of thing. You start collapsing morality and law into each other, then you make the other mistake, and that is if the government passes a law, that implies that whatever they're prohibiting is wrong. So if the government says um, uh, uh, it's illegal to pay someone less than a minimum wage, then it's immoral to not pay someone a minimum wage. right? So they start taking their lead from what the legislator says, which is basically a, a, just a mortal set of fallible human beings with their opinions. But because they have the power of the government, they can make law. But because people think of law and morality as linked together, you know. People say this, even some libertarians say this. Like, for example, on the intellectual property issue, a lot because a lot of libertarians are not anarchists like me. They're they're limited government types, and they tend to be American, and they tend to worship the Constitution, and they admit the Constitution is flawed, but they think it's roughly a semi-libertarian document. So if I say, well, intellectual property is unjust, hmm. quite often I'll hear someone say, well, the Constitution authorizes it. Yeah, I know. I know the Constitution authorizes it, but that's like saying we should abolish slavery, and your response is, but slavery is legal. <laughs> it's like I know. I'm saying we should abolish it because it's wrong, because I have a standard of morality and justice outside of the law, Yeah. which, which religion, religious people should appreciate because in theory they imagine that there's a higher law up in God's mind or God's realm or, or something, but the point is that… Normal mortal human law and lawmakers and kings, all these people, they're all subject to an outside standard of, of right and wrong. Mm. Now, we might disagree on where that standard comes from. Like, does it come from God? I think if you say God, it comes from God, that pushes it back one level. It's legal yeah. positivism to another level because what you're yeah. saying is God can decree. Now, I think there's some confusion among, among theists because… Some people say God is good, right? I mean, maybe you would say God is good. Yeah, but when you say that, do you mean that God is good by definition? 
because whatever good is is whatever he says? Or do you mean he happens to be conformed to an external set of criteria called goodness? And we're lucky that we live in a world where the God that happens to exist happens to be a good one, but he's good because he conforms to an external standard that he can create. So God could not make murder good. He could punish you for not committing murder or whatever. If we had a wicked God, he could punish you. Yeah, he so, could tell you, but but he, he 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 couldn't make two plus two equals five, and he couldn't make contradictions true, and he can't make right wrong. So the even by a serious theological standpoint, even God is not the source of goodness. He is um, compatible with it, but he doesn't so, make it. Yeah, uh, generally. The theist response, and perhaps I should say my response would be that like God, uh, God's nature is good, you know. Now, of course, the question is why is God's nature the way it is? Yeah, and that's a different the, question. Yeah, yeah. The response is that God's nature is necessary. God's necessarily perfect. Correct. So, but, but 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 even then he's he's complying with an outside standard of goodness. He might yes, he might have to be maybe. good. He's maybe nature. it's impossible to have an evil god. Maybe, but yeah. but the point is, goodness is a standard that's not just his decree. Put it that way. It's not just what he like. You if you, if you're correct, then you couldn't have a god that could decree um, dishonesty and wickedness to be bad to be good. Yes, he can. It's, 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 it's inconceivable. Yes, he cannot do that. So from that point of view, that perspective is one where there's a, an external standard of good to us on the earth, and we can evaluate laws and practices compared to that standard. So we can say this law is either good or bad because it's either just or it's not just in accordance with a higher set of values. So just because the Constitution says copyright is – is authorized doesn't mean that it's just because yeah. that's just the opinion of a bunch of humans who wrote this document mm -hmm. and th their word can be false it can be incompatible with the higher natural law yeah so i mean uh, to us we discover these these god's commands in my, in my view like see i'm not religious so i'm pretty much going by i thought wait wait i thought you said you believed in god Yes, I believe in God, but I'm not religious. Like, that's what's the thing. The, uh, what's the difference? Yes, yeah, so religious, I would say, like, generally seem to be people who subscribe to certain forms of religion, and they believe in a certain book or scripture, and they believe laws that are div divine revelation, basically. They believe in a specific divine revelation, that this is revealed by God. Now, I believe that, God, yes, God exists, God is good, and the way we discover these moral laws or the way we, way we like, think about this is not through divine revelation. Like, the religious theists, some of my friends who are religious theists, they say that you can discover some of God's commands and laws by reasoning and also by divine revelation. Right. Now, I currently say that just use reasoning well you well that's it. that's the idea of faith like so the according to ayn rand and these types which i tend to agree with it's the idea of faith versus reason so faith if you look at it strictly faith is supposed to be um a way of gaining knowledge other than reason and reason would include uh, like logical thought and reasoning and empirical evidence right so yeah. our, the evidence of the senses plus our reasoning process. Yeah. According to Rand, the only the only source of knowledge is um, is reason and evidence, and I yeah. tend to agree mm -hmm. with that. Faith yeah, so faith can't be a source because faith is just us believing something for no reason. I do not like define faith that way. Like faith is, I mean. I'm not going to define it because I mean it's that's a different thing, and I'm not sure that much about faith. But I, but I would but you say, like, but you just said you reject you reject divine revelation, so I'm seeing a parallel there to, uh, to yeah, I mean, to, 
the, the you, just said it's, you just said it's only reason. So that's kind of the, the realistic Randian view. Yeah, yes, that, that's, yes, I agree with that. No, what I was saying that like, there are different definitions of faith, basically. Uh, the divine revelation theists, you know, the religious three theists say that. So like Calvinists would say that the faith, faith is response to God, like when Holy Spirit works with you and something like that. And it's knowledge, faith is knowledge. Now, some other theists would define faith different way. They might define it as a hope, you know, or something like that. Or trust, so, yeah, trust or, or something. Trust, you know, yeah, or trust yeah, in yeah, something. Yeah. Like, you know, Kierkegaard would say like, take a leap of faith or something like that. You know, it's, it's some kind of trust. So, yeah, I mean, so now I think libertarianism is compatible with the view that I hold of God. Uh, and like, I think in fact, even- Hold on, but, but, you, but you said you believe in God, but you, you reject divine revelation. So- How do I do that, right? That's no, you said, question. well, I'm asking, well, how, why do you believe there's a God? Yeah, so the reason why is that uh, there are like arguments for the existence of God, you know, like contingency argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff like that. So I think those arguments are persuasive. I'm persuaded by them. And but they, but they only, they only prove something. They only purport to prove something very general and vague. They don't prove there's a personal God. They don't prove that. Uh, there are two stages of their the arguments from what I read. So one stage is uh, the stage one is basically to uh, prove or argue for a necessary being. Yeah, a, 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 a final a final uh, cause or something like that. Yeah, you could an, an ultimate an ultimate cause. I mean, like yeah, you could say ultimate foundation existence. or something like that. So the, then the stage two basically argues that this being is benevolent or good. You can even to... argue. You can even argue that, but that's still not the same thing as. A personal God, I don't know, uh, intelligence may be another thing, but certainly not the cl the classical conception of God that in 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 um in Islam and uh, Judaism and Christianity. Yes. I, I think I don't think you can use these arguments to get to that kind of God. Yes, that's true, and I think Aquinas acknowledged that. He said that right. He said that like natural theology can only perhaps get you to a, some kind of a good God, but it's not going to get you to Jesus, right? Correct. Uh, or some, or, or or Islam, or something like that. So or even a even a loving God, or something like that. That's even that's no, harder to. Now I would probably dispute that because benevolent is one thing, but but loving is a whole different thing. That implies too much human characteristics to this entity, whatever he is. I would say like goodness seems to would involve like generosity kindness love and these like so so there's a dis there are different models of god there is classical theism then there is neoclassical yeah. theism then there is open theism i mean know? i think so, it gets you to get you to deism basically basically i think it just gets you to deism because obviously whatever god there is he's allowed the holocaust to happen and things like that so obviously yeah, he, i mean you can come up with cute arguments all you want that well he's a loving god but he's going to let genocide happened it's like well yeah that's he, he's I mean, obviously he's obviously pretty hands off <laughs> yeah i mean that's true, <laughs> right like problem of evil problem of suffering is in my view like is a serious problem i have my own responses it, it, it's, that. it's a problem if you have this classical personal view of god view but if you if you if you only think he's the ds view it's not a problem at all it's just well he's he got their universe in motion and it's up to us to make of it what we want or something like that, you know, but, but yeah. then it doesn't get, it doesn't help you that much. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's just a general background idea that there's some purpose to the universe, but it doesn't tell you what that is. It doesn't tell you what laws we should have. It doesn't tell you what our morals should be. The only way you get that is if you insert revelation and you say, okay, now we know there's a God. Now we know he must sometimes give special insights to his prophets and we can listen to what they say and get more concrete prescriptions from his wisdom so you have to at some point make this uh 
you know this this divine revelation jump to get anything useful out of this concept i would think i, I would say like the well if if there is a good god right uh, now i think goodness in some sense uh, has certain features right like a, a, we consider justice to be good and perhaps many other values associated okay. with goodness right so when we say that someone is a good person or has a good character we there there is certain expectations or values that flow from it like we would expect that person to be just just you know that person to be yeah but, but however i mean classical philosophy did all this without i mean you know just the philosophical analysis of the virtues and what it means to lead a good life i this is this is the application of reason by itself how, yeah. how 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 did even knowing that there is a god much less knowing anything about his nature or what he said how does that help you in this re, in this task of reason to to um to figure out what human virtues are i think why is it reason sufficient to to figure out human virtues why is reason sufficient to figure out human virtues? I mean, why isn't it? It should be. It should be sufficient. It seems to have been yeah, sufficient. We we know yeah, some. I mean, we know some things about the virtues. The the Greeks figured it out a long time ago. Yeah, I mean, we've been. I did know. not say that. Like, it's it's due to God that we are good or something. I mean, right. I mean, so so what what so what does it matter whether you believe in God or not for this analysis? How does it help inform your analysis or help aid the analysis? Like libertarianism? Anything, any ethical, moral, political theory, justice, any of these things. I mean, how would it I, how would it change an argument if I if I argue that it's unjust to, you know, rob someone? How do you how do you contradict that by saying, "Oh no, I know that there's a God, and therefore it's okay to steal from someone." Or how do you say, oh, you're right, and you can reinforce your argument by saying there's a God. I don't see how it adds or subtracts to the yeah, application so of reason. I think, like, I just I just use reason to, you know, as, right. I, as you said, right, to to know something just on yeah, but, but what's the title of your podcast? <laughs> Unorthodox Libertarian Theology, right? Theology, but, right, theology. But, but theology does not mean that you have to use some of these books or divine revelation as far as I know. No, that's like, what I'm saying, but it, you, it has to use something about God, and I'm asking what does it use because I, I can't see how the general think, bare fact of God's existence as a good being, how does that inform libertarian analysis? Hmm. Well, perhaps like the thing is like uh, – uh, the name of the channel I made was because there are certain positions that I hold. One is libertarianism and one is belief in God. And oh, I see. Unorthodox means my position is unorthodox among theists, right? Generally, theists have divine revelation and, you know, you, are, you, will, you will go to hell, eternal hell, or for if you commit certain kinds of crimes. Now, my views are that. Uh, there, there is some punishment for crimes, for harms in the afterlife, but they are not like eternal kind of punishment, you know, suffering forever. Like you, it's not like Dante's Inferno, you know, torture or something like that. You're, you're going to let Hitler out of jail at some point? <laughs> I mean, uh, how much do you want Hitler to be tortured? <laughs> at, at, at least, at least 20 years. Yes, he will be tortured 20 years. So <laughs> I, you, you get what you want. I mean, I mean, uh, there, there will be there will be punishment for Hitler and some of these these well, people. Well, you know, um, I, I I used to be into C.S. Lewis. I don't know if you've read much of him, but uh, I, I'm very attracted to his. Even though I'm an atheist, um, I'm attracted to his his kind of overall approach to to theism. And like he he had this scene in. In the Chronicles of Narnia, and and the final, the seventh book is called um, the Last Battle. It's about Armageddon. It's it's a, it's a meta, it's an analogy or a metaphor or a different reenactment to Armageddon, which is you know the end of everything. Hmm. And basically, all the animals 
and all the in, in this world all the animals are intelligent so they're like humans so they're approaching this opening where aslan who's jesus or god is sitting there and they can either run past him into the light and go to uh aslan's country or heaven basically or they can run off into the wilderness to, into the dark and it's up to them though so they look at aslan's face and if they feel terror they run away and if they feel if they smile and they feel joy they run they're welcomed in and they go past him but it's not him doing it it's whether they want to or not so if they feel terror it's because they've corrupted their souls to a point where they hate goodness and they alienated themselves from it, and they just become dumb animals, and they run off into the wilderness. So, and and that's that's compatible with what I was taught as a Catholic, that by a modern Catholic, that hell is not this punishment; it's just the absence of the presence of God. You're just not in the presence of yeah, God. But that's that's I think a very modernistic liberal view, like the Augustinian view and Aquinas's view, and even traditional Islamic view is that. You will suffer in hell. It is retributive. God will make sure that you will suffer. And but but it, but but, but, but that, I think I think that's o that's overly. Uh, it's understandable people would come up with these stories and these metaphors to explain it. But really, it's not like God wants to punish people. He's not like sadistic. In fact, you could argue that you know you could argue that um, you could argue that hell is in that conception of hell is. Um, is 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 evil but and and therefore god a good god would never create it because yeah. god god creates these these beings out of nothingness right human beings that never yeah. existed they they come into being and mm -hmm. he gives them free will and they're basically forced to choice to choose and to live a life where they're forced to choose good or evil now they have the opportunity to choose the good and all that but some of them are going to choose evil and if they choose evil and they choose a horrible life and they end up being tortured, not even forever, but even for a million years or something, you know, it's like that person would have been better off never to have been born at all. And God knows this. So why would God bring into existence beings that he knows are going to choose evil and be tortured? That's sadistic. Yeah. So so, <laughs> so what you what you could argue is which I, I use that to argue that. Therefore, in this world that we live, whenever you see an evil person, they're just a robot. They're not really real. <laughs> God so, never creates people that are actually going to choose evil. But if I figure this out, God, I figured out God's secret of the universe, and he's going to send his hit squad out to come get me. So That's a little so, bit sci-fi. So the, I think the Calvinist view is that God created for his own glory. And, right. Uh, so, in fact, uh, the fact that the sinners are suffering in hell extremely in extreme pain forever, it increases his glory. How? You know? That's crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's not crazy to them, right? Like, I mean, to them… Because they believe, they believe in divine revelation. You could never make this stuff up. <laughs> I mean, you, you couldn't deduce this from reason. This has to be divine revelation. Yes, you cannot deduce that. It increases God's glory when people like suffer in extreme pain or suffering and like their, their justification, their justification for for eternal hell is that any, any, any sin, any sin you commit against a being with infinite goodness, infinite uh, virtue and infinite like holiness or majesty, like th the intuition behind this is that, look, it is more wrong to punch a dog compared to punching a dandelion. And similarly, it is more wrong to punch a human being compared to a dog. So if you offend God, who is a being with infinite goodness, virtue, you know, infinite. Yeah, whatever. but you see, you're, you're playing it, but you're playing with words because you're not punching God. You're offend now you said offending. But like I said earlier, you can't violate God's rights. You really can't do an injustice against God. You can't harm God. Yes, especially because true. especially because he's omnipotent and he's omniscient he knows and he created you he so he created someone he knows he's going to do something he's not like surprised by it <laughs> so yeah, you're, surprised. That's so true. offending i don't know what that means to, to offend uh, all you're doing is you're disappointing him maybe yes that's the thing right like they would say that if you break any of his commands 
then God is justified in torturing you forever because that's Brady, fine. But but it's not because you offended. I mean, and he's not even you're not even disappointing him because he knows what you're going to do. So I, I don't know this whole. Well, they would they would say that uh, you you had free will and at least some things like. I'm I'm simply saying God is not surprised when you sin. That's all I'm saying. Yes, that's true. But I mean, like it's their view. You know, I'm trying to like be charitable, you know, like kind of give their justifications why they say that. You know, I, I think your views, I don't know if you know much about Catholicism, but uh, your views are compatible with at least some modern versions of Catholicism, the, the kind I was taught, which is that it was basically that – and this is why Protestants really hate Catholicism because it's, it's – um, it's not completely uh, sola scriptura based only on the Bible, um, although it's rooted in it. So the, the Catholics believe that the purpose of – so they don't have this belief in like you get saved on the earth by saying some kind of spell or incantation, yeah. and you're forever saved, which turns into a question of knowledge right? because they'll say like, well, it's important that you know you're saved, which I don't, I don't know where they get that from. I don't think it is important that you know it. And I don't think you can know it. So like they'll say, for example, once saved, always saved. Um, and so you'll say, well, some people that get saved go on to commit crimes, so they can't go to hell. And they're, they'll weasel out of it, and they'll say, well, if you commit a grave sin later on, that means you never were saved in the first place. It's like, yeah, but that means I can't know I was saved because I thought I was saved. You know, so like the whole thing collapses. But the Catholic view is more like when you go to heaven, you're in God's presence. But to be in God's presence, you need to be basically cleansed. You need to be worthy to be in his presence. Mm-hmm. So you have to die in a state of, of grace. That's the whole point of, of the sacraments to help you get there, right? But the idea is if you die and it's not mortal sin, but you, you're not fully in a state of grace, then you go to purgatory. But it's not like temporary hell or punishment. It's just like the place where you go to gradually remove your the stains on your soul so that you're worthy to go to heaven finally. And some Catholics, if I'm not mistaken, believe that that's what – there is no hell. Like everyone's in purgatory unless you die as a saint basically. Like everyone goes to purgatory after earth. And you work it out until you finally cleanse your soul enough to go to heaven. So yeah, yeah if you're really evil when you die like Hitler, it might take a long time to finally cleanse yeah. your soul and to, to but purge. That, purg- but that's I think not the traditional Catholic view, you know, like the traditional. No, I was taught in the seven. I was taught in the seventies after the sort of uh, the hippies took over. That's why probably you know you. That's why probably you have the general liberal views. But the traditional Catholic view, I think, and I think even still, like the Catechism says that if you die in mortal sin, like as soon as you commit mortal sin, you have to you have to confess. You must confess. And if you die in mortal sin, unrepentant, then that's it. You shall suffer in hell forever. Now, of course, the view is that. It's separation from, from God, and that separation feels like extreme pain and suffering. You know, that's, I suppose, Catholic view, but now I, I do not agree with that. Like, God will not let you at least be in this eternal state of suffering or eternal state of separation. I think in my view, he would still give you chances after death. Now, Catholics do not. Yeah, that's what I say. That's similar to this purgatory notion I'm talking about. It's basically a way to finally get re- to rehabilitate yourself. Yeah. Okay, so that would be cool. That would be cool. And I think I I have I have seen I have read uh, like one of one of my he's not my friend because I've not met him, but like one of the YouTube channels that I watch, he's he's called Christian Idealism and he's a Catholic and he does not believe in like a Dante's infernal kind of hell or something like that. And he has some form of universalist leanings, I think, something like those. But anyways, my general approach is like to, to support libertarianism and kind of, you know, uh, criticize uh, kind of traditionalistic views which are you know against libertarianism and also which are which which are these very retributive views where the person is actually burning 
actually in great misery and pain forever for like something like blasphemy, right? Yeah. So well, I mean, I, I I personally think religion, any religion I'm aware of, and I think inherently, but they're all contradictory. I mean, what I think is religion is the remnants of primitive philosophy, right? As humans developed, they came up with started coming up with explanations for cause and effect in the world. You know, what why does the sun come up every day because of the sun god? So it was sort of a primitive explanation. And over time, that turned into religion. It got encrusted with all these other things because yeah. people took – they used it for power, and they used it for rituals, and they used it for organizing their life and different things like that. So religion embodies a lot of customary and you know, societal knowledge. So most religions recommend moral codes that are roughly – I won't say libertarian, but you know, don't steal, don't hurt people, be honest, be good. But they're encrusted with all the other mumbo jumbo too, right? But so what I, what I would do and what I, I tend to do when I talk to religious people who are not libertarian, mm. I don't think they have a, a, a consistent philosophy. So parts of it are illiberal. Yes. You know, like if, if, if the command says you should stone gays, that's, that's illiberal. Um, but parts of it, you know, so what I do is I appeal to the, the good parts, and those parts tend to resonate with their intuitions too and their practical knowledge. So I say, yeah. listen, God wants you to be honest. God wants you to uh, you know, profit from your labor, and God wants us to be fruitful and multiply, and God wants us not to commit uh, theft and all this. So libertarians support a view that is completely consistent with what God really wants. We just yeah. we have it worked out more. We have more knowledge of economics and this kind of stuff, and we have a more consistent working out of the underlying ethics of God's views. Yeah. So that's what I tend to do. I think you try to appeal to the good part of their religious beliefs and show that they're compatible with libertarianism. Yeah, that, that's also why I try my best to do that. Though generally the traditionalists are like generally have the prepared arguments against uh, libertarianism one is one one argument is basically that uh, libertarian libertarianism or liberalism leads to you know these de leads to degeneracy and these kinds of you know like libertarianism allows for prostitution to go rampant it allows for you know uh, right. Last I mean, it allows for alcohol to be legal. Yeah, but for, 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 you know, for these people, you could say something like, okay, if you allow prostitution or uh, pornography or whatever, yeah, it seems on the surface that it's, it's contributing to degeneracy because they're assuming that if you just pass a law, it will stop it. But you could say to stop it, you have to have a state. And the state is going to be run by corrupt human beings, and there's going to be public choice problems, and there's going to be special interest problems, and there's going to be waste and corru you know, corruption, and, and the state's not going to stop there. And the state's going to do lots of other things that cause lots of other problems. So you could say that even if in an ideal world we could have you know, Jesus run the government and do it right, we don't have Jesus running the government. So in the real world, we need to be humble. And have a set of principles that let us run our own lives and be guided by God's word and grace and all this kind of stuff. And we have to tolerate the fact that sometimes people will do things that are wrong, but but the benefit of that is we don't set this huge Leviathan state in motion that does lots of other things that you're not going to like either. So in other words, they're just naive about the nature of the state. If yeah. they really understood the nature of the state, they would realize it's not a tool to do what they want to do. It just won't work. Didn't they also like criticize anarcho-capitalism, basically saying that look, so anarcho-capitalism has like will have at least some different communities, right, operating autonomously. Now uh, our community will have rules like we will we will stone gays, we will we will kill anyone who commits blasphemy and something like that. Libertarianism or liberalism does not prevent any of that. Like liberalism, well, libertarianism does not have any kind of. Okay, okay, but but recognizing that you could have a diverse world of different communities and different traditions doesn't mean that you should be in favor of that. <laughs> doesn't mean you should be in favor of a given community having those laws. Um, 
the fact that you might not be able to stop all bad things, again, doesn't mean that they're, they're not bad things. So what I would say is if you have a community that has stoning of gays, um, we might not be able to stop that because you could have an isolated community or tribe somewhere and no one bothers them and they don't bother anyone else, but they're doing horrible things behind doors. Um, I would say as long as they let people leave, then – the best solution is to just let people leave if they don't want to live there and if they have a horrible set of rules. Now, I think that over time, communities that have unjust laws like that are going to tend to suffer. So they're going to competitively – they're going to be at a competitive disadvantage to other communities. So they're just going to come – they're just going to get – they're going to die, but they're going to atrophy away. They're not yeah. going to – they're not going to survive. Or put it this way. The societies that tend to flourish will be the more cosmopolitan – open secular liberal yeah open societies i think they will tend to make more money and they'll be healthier people will be happier people will move there yeah but and from saudi arabia uh, right like they, they allow they allow well the, the if god if god had not put oil under those people then we wouldn't have this problem they'd just be a bunch of uh you know people in the desert tribes that we could ignore but unfortunately god put oil under them so I think that's why I think God's a practical joker. Even their countries in some sense is changing, right? Like Saudi Arabia allowed these festivals, right? These new, these big festivals. And there were some traditionalists who are opposing Saudi Arabia allowing these festivals because they think it's it's very bad. But but to Saudi Arabia, it's it's generating revenue, right? Like this uh, is- I, I'm not aware of that, but I I, I, I imagine that over time. Most cultures will will tend to liberalize as the world gets richer, communication increases as we become more modern. I think over yeah, time yeah. they'll they'll they will liberalize too. Yeah. Um, but they can hold on and do a lot of damage in the meantime. But I, I don't know any solution to that other than be patient. Other, other than I think spreading liber- libertarian views, you know, and kind of like perhaps discussion and debates with traditionalists would be helpful in like. Yeah, I agree. And there are some – there are some. Um, I think like you mentioned Mustafa Akyal, who I've met in, at Hapa's group in Turkey before. He's uh, – there are, there are liberal-minded uh, uh, Muslim thinkers and Arabs and people like that. Um, yeah. Um, and you have examples too. I mean Turkey, Turkey secularized a long time ago, and uh, I don't know if it's going to last, but – they seem to have, you know, girl, women in bikinis running around everywhere, and it's it's bizarre how they were able to break out of the, uh, the traditional Muslim world. Yeah, I mean, uh, generally, even even I think the traditional Muslim world seems to be, as I said, right, like they allowed festivals, music festivals, perhaps, or something like that. So they are liberalizing slowly, but even then, they are like arguing against liberalism and like presenting these arguments and my channel is in some sense is to kind of you know uh, criticize these kinds of traditionalist views to and let more people liberalize you know be more liberal and chill rather than well, you know, I, I, I mean i i believe that just as you have some of my friends that are christian libertarians and they keep trying to tell their fellow christians Look, the principles we really believe in and Jesus' words really – you should really be a libertarian or at least something like moving in that direction. And I think that some some Muslims um, can make the same argument. Now, Jews, I'm not sure about the same thing, but um, but but um, I mean there's lots of Jewish libertarians, but I don't know about textual support for liberalism. But I know that there are some Muslims who claim that um, there's lots of support for – you know, liberal values, at least politically and legally speaking. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I, th- I think we should wrap this up in a minute. If you if you want to have a part two, I'd be happy to do it. But um, okay, okay. Anything Wait, else you yeah. want to wrap up with? Uh, uh what, what, what? I said, Sorry. is there anything else you want to wrap up with, or a final? Oh yeah. Point my or last words, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, yeah. My last words would be like. Uh, I hope you friends enjoyed it. Like I'm addressing my audience. I hope your friends enjoyed this video. And uh, I would love to do a part two in the future with you, Dr. Kinsella, because I want to talk about intellectual property and perhaps 
some of the libertarian arguments against intellectual property you know i mean okay okay we can do that we, we can we can do uh, more installments but thanks for talking to me and uh thank you thank yeah, you yeah we'll be in touch yeah great have a great day sir thanks